So I want you to meet a friend of mine. Dr. David Alt is someone I've known for a long, long time. Um, he, I first met him as a musician, singer, songwriter, but he is one of the more powerful metaphysicians in the new thought movement. He was senior minister at the Atlanta Center for Spiritual Living for many years. And he stepped away and he is, I, I know that you will be lifted up, you will be inspired, his heart, his integrity. Everything about this guy is, is I, I kind of want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> anyway, would you welcome please Dr. David Alt. Oh my gosh, good morning. Do you know, um, I found religious science here in Southern California, in Los Angeles. My uh, surrogate mom, my new thought mom was Louise Hay. And I was in a trio called Alliance, and that was my doorway into all things metaphysical, and she was kind enough when she hit it big to take us on the road with her. So I got a crash course in not only these principles that have revolutionized my life, but I also got to observe someone who lived those principles even in an era and a time when those principles seem so difficult to comprehend. You know what the principle I'm talking about is? We sang it in one of our opening songs, God is all that there is. It's the fundamental thing. And I learned that, I learned how to pray that, I learned how to speak on that for decades as an ordained minister in uh, religious science. And there was a moment in time where I began to question my understanding of that principle. And I know that you have been there as well. It really is rather difficult, right, to go from the intellectual conceptual mind of God is all that there is and then enter back out into the world where everything, the noise and the volume and the, the, uh, the visual seems to counter that. And my goal today is to help us all together to find a new understanding, to dare to dream beyond the human understanding of that principle into a daring, which I think is similar to pioneering or leaning into a mystery that has long since eluded us. I have to start with this. Someone once came up to Albert Einstein, a reporter, and they said, what must it be like to be a genius? And he looked at them and he said, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. And they go, well, you're obviously a genius, and what is your definition of genius? And Einstein paused for a moment and he said, to me, it's affability. So if you look at the word affability, it's cordiality, the ability to sort of create this beautiful, calm, peaceful atmosphere. But there's a deeper meaning to affability. And it is the ability to take the most complex thing and explain it in simple terms. So Einstein said to this reporter, I do not consider my, myself a genius unless I have the ability to take quantum theory or all of the other things that have been a part of my life and explain it to a kindergartner. And I like that because I sometimes feel like a kindergartner when it comes to the principle, particularly in this human spacesuit where I'm walking around in this plane of duality. So kind of my goal today is to let's dive into this pool of affability and find a way to bring a new sense of aliveness, a new sense of enthusiasm to what it means to just go beyond the surface understanding of dare to dream and to something that is really going to be tangible, tangible that we can all take with us and practice that. So one of the affable teachers I came across during the pandemic, his name is Brian Cox and he is an Australian particle physicist. You know, you watch, right? That's what you look at that stuff every day. And I came across him, of all things, TikTok. And I was like, he started to talk about the Hubble telescope. Do you guys remember the Hubble telescope? So in the beginning, when this thing came to be, it had a bit of a PR problem. And those who were involved in the initial launching of this telescope were trying to be really careful because the expense and everything surrounding that, they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. And they had grand plans for the use of this. 
And each one on that initial team had the liberty to have their own time and their own usage of the telescope in the very beginning. And one of these team members said, I want 100 consecutive hours. And they said, what are you going to use the telescope for 100 consecutive hours? He goes, I'm going to point it into the nothingness. And they were like, there's got to be more to it than that. Long story short, he got his way. He got his 100 consecutive hours. And Brian Cox is telling this story. And he said he took a postage stamp size of blackness in the sky, just the void. And he and his team aimed the telescope at that. And the goal was, for these 100 consecutive hours, they were going to keep penetrating and penetrating and penetrating into this postage stamp blackness of a void. And if you're up on all things Hubble telescope, guess what they found? They penetrated into more than a billion galaxies into a little black postage stamp size of the void of the sky. Now, we have one galaxy. We call it the Milky Way, right? We think sometimes in this dualistic plane of form that this is all that there is. And it's maddening to try to take a principle that says God is all there is and cram it into this singular dimensional plane of form. In fact, during COVID, I remember, you know, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's like I woke up one day and I went, oh, ooh, insanity is forcing a singular dimensional answer into a multi-dimensional experience. And all of a sudden, our shared principle made so much sense. Because we are looking day to day, moment by moment, second by second at effect over and over again. And it's very hard to reconcile that. In Buddhism, they call it uh, shunyata, which is the inability to take that which is infinite and understand it in the finite realm. And all of us go through that. So our teaching, our principle is based on something that's not confined to a singular dimensional realm, but to a multi-dimensional experience. My beloved partner and I, we have these morning coffee discussions early, and then by 9 o'clock, and we both got to go to work, we're like, no, we're right into this. And he said to me one day, and he goes, we watched that Brian Cox video together, and he goes, and isn't it amazing that those billions, billions with a B, galaxies are still in this singular dimension? I don't know if it's too early to comprehend that or not. <laughs> All of that is still in like channel one. And there are infinite channels or infinite dimensionality, which then applies to our principle. God is all that there is. It's very much the Bhagavad Gita where Arjun goes to Krishna and he says, I want to know what you know. And Krishna goes, no, you don't. And that's the real text, right? No, you don't. And, and he goes, no, I do, I do. And he like keeps going after Krishna, begging him. And Krishna finally goes and he opens his, like this big mouth portal. And he sees, Arjun sees all of that multidimensionality. Everything, everywhere, all at once. And he can't handle it. Neither can we fully handle that principle, but here's the beauty of paradox. If we begin to chip away at our resistance and our customization and seduction of that duality, then slowly by slowly, we begin to comprehend more and more what daring to dream beyond surface condition actually means. I call it my gospel of any way. I get up, I face all of this duality, and I go forward anyway, recognizing that by showing up and leaning into the thing that looks oppositional to this principle, more will be revealed, just like penetrating. Like you and I are walking around Hubble telescopes, and if we're willing to keep showing up and penetrating more and more, more and more is revealed. That's why I loved what you read 
about tithing. It's the same thing, right? The more it becomes personal, the more that that principle then is supported and understood. So I want to help you out. I want to help myself out. I want to help all of us out and be more affable so we can understand what this means. And so I came across something that I think is quite helpful. And it's actually the five hindrances of Buddhism. Oh, joy. The five <laughs> hindrances of Buddhism. So the Buddha said, these are the hindrances. And you've got to pay attention to this part. These are the hindrances that are automatic by you dropping down into human form. So in other words, you plopped in, your soul is here for this immaculate reason, but you got put into a, let's say a sandbox. It's the community sandbox. The sandbox is the singular dimension. The sandbox is yin and yang, right? The sandbox is all things duality, separation. It's not that you did anything wrong or I did anything wrong or we're not spiritual enough or we're out of principle, which I don't believe you can be because you already innately are pure essence, but it's just a matter of remembering and forgetting. And the Buddha said, if you can recognize these five hindrances, understand that you didn't do anything wrong in your participation of them because it's what you were born into. It's like you got plopped into those clothes. And the more that you live by this gospel of anyway, and you go out and you face these things and you look beyond those appearances and we practice and we call for, we actually demand that principle to be known to us. When you get all five of those done, we're all enlightened. Isn't that cool? Let's see if we can do it by lunch. Okay, <laughs> number one, what do you think the first hindrance is? Desire. And we're not talking about like, Ernest Holmes would call it the inner propulsion to want to expand and grow. This is the kind of desire that has its roots and its tentacles in coveting something. You know when you see what somebody else has and you want it, and you long for it, or you get scared, or you feel like, limitation somehow there's not going to be enough we all go through that right it's both subtle and very profane at times so one of the hindrances is this desire of thinking that something that you need is outside of you i don't know about you but that comes up a lot and the buddha said if you are able to recognize that lean into that Every single time that that comes in and you feel as though you've lost somehow because someone else got it, that's a hindrance. That feeds that sense of dualism. And I love in Buddhist business practices, they have a way that helps to counter that one singular hindrance. And it's this. Find something that you want that inner propulsion, that level of desire, the one that's your kind of creative spark. Find the thing that has such tremendous meaning for you and then go help someone else achieve that. Isn't that amazing? And by doing that, what do you think happens? By selflessly doing that, not by self-promoting, look what I did, but by doing that quietly, earnestly, sincerely, helping someone else to reach fulfillment of the thing that is creatively speaking inside of you dismantles all of the idea of limitation, of not enoughness. And I think back sometimes and I go, I had some people in my life that helped me do that. And all of the sudden, you can begin to see that practical application is, is helping chip away so that that particular hindrance no longer rules your life, be it conscious or unconscious. The second one is ill will. You know the little thought crimes that we have in our mind 24 seven? <laughs> ah, ill will, what does that do? Well. If we engage in any kind of ill will, yeah, any kind of ill will, 
No margin for, well, this is deserving ill will. None of that. It's all pervasive ill will. Then we, again, continue to be mired down into this singular dimension of separation, which leads to suffering, perpetual suffering, ill will. And one of my favorite teachers, uh, Ram Das, had a beautiful anecdote for this particular hindrance. So he had a puja table, an altar, where he had all of his pictures of the saints and sages and wisdom teachers, even his personal guru. And every morning in his spiritual practice, when he would come to the altar, to the puja, to do his morning ritual and his morning practice, he would look at them. So it would be like, hello, Krishna. Good morning, Buddha. Hello, Anandama, his guru. Hello, beloved Neem Karoli Baba. Hello, Jesus. And then on that same puja, he took whatever was the most inflamed ill will person, and he put their picture on his altar as well. And so at the time, he was so incensed by, I think he was the head of the Department of Defense, Casper Weinberger, <laughs> hated this person. Hate, and he, would, he couldn't recon reconcile the ill will that he had inside of him and then be this spiritual teacher. And he's like, oh my God, I gotta do something. So he put Casper Weinberger's picture up there next to Buddha and Jesus. So I got in the morning, good morning, Buddha. Hello, Krishna. Hello, Anandama. Hello, Neem Karoli Baba. Hello, Jesus. Hello, Casper. <laughs> and he just kept at it. He just kept at it until slowly, he began to experience and be willing to lean into the idea that even that person that he held so much contempt for was the same, one and the same, that there was no separation. This has been a particularly fun exercise for me. I need to get a bigger altar table. <laughs> There's a lot of pictures on there. Um, and. I will say it's very much like a similar practice of our traditional Ho'oponopono prayer, where you say that silent four stands of prayer and you recognize, you recognize the beautiful oneness of that. Try it, go out, cut some pictures, put it on your altar space, spend a little time with that and slowly see, lean into the idea of daring to dream beyond the perception of that person in order to see things all holy, in order to bring integrity to the principle that says the only reality is God. Can you see that when you are experiencing the target of our ill will? We get to practice together, right? Third one, sloth and torpor. It's just fun to say, <laughs> sloth and torpor. I mean, my head goes forward every time I say it. Sloth and torpor. What is sloth and torpor? Sloth and torpor is like inertia, stagnation. And, and so the way that I see this most prevalent in the teachings and the people that I work with on a consistent basis, it's sort of like a low-level despair. Low-level despair, meaning we are so used to functioning even with despair that we will get up, go through our routine, and still hold that sense of despair that keeps us inert in hope, God forbid, daring to dream something bigger than that. And so we begin to look at those things and we begin to lean into that and to recognize and to know and to move in, which is very indicative of this theme today, is to turn to the things that frighten you most. Face them, turn to them, instead of justifying and medicating and moving and all the things that we do in order to prevent those things. Now lean into them. It's good old face your fear. And the willingness and the intent that, that we have in doing that helps eliminate and chip away from that stagnation. The fourth one is um, agitation. How many of you have already suffered this morning from agitation, <laughs> right? I like this word, inflammation. You know, there's this thing called social media 
And if you go on there and you see the amount of inflammation, like sometimes I'll go, inflammation, 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 that also has a way of solidifying itself even in our physical body. And so one of the th helpful things with that is if you become agitated or inflamed, if you're a keyboard warrior and the moment something ticks you off, you're on that keyboard and you're ready to do that, 24-hour pause. Do I have an agreement? 24-hour pause. What happens in that 24 hours? A little bit of clarity comes back. A little bit of that which is the trigger begins to soften. And we begin to eliminate more and more and more being reactive and becoming more and more responsive and attuned to, again, back to that reality. 24-hour pause. You're all going to sign a contract today that says you're going to do that. And lastly is doubt. Just good old-fashioned doubt. Once I thought that doubt is, at its most fundamental, a mistrust in the divine. If you and I begin to think about every time we are doubting something, see, doubting is, is uh, interesting because it's a lifestyle. In fact, it's heralded. And the way in which it's heralded and we are groomed in this singular dimension is by living what I call prevention energy. Prevention energy is planning, doing, manufacturing, maneuvering, positioning in a way that we are keeping something at bay. Now, we're still human. This is the paradox, right? We're still going to get up in the morning. We're still going to do all of the human things. But every single time that doubt comes in, we, again, begin to lean into that and find a way to trust anyway. And I know that that doesn't mean anything unless you and I are actually doing it. I have a nonprofit. It's called Kaleidoscope Child Foundation. We serve over 1,000 kids in the most vulnerable territories in the world. And uh, mostly it's centered around global education. And Louise Hay, my secondary mom, was my first angel patron. When I finally got nonprofit status, um, she helped buoy me and keep me afloat in those first years. Somebody, Victoria LaFortune is here. She went on a trip, I think it's 2013, 2013. She's been hanging with me and has been to Cambodia, and uh, she's going to come in January to Cambodia and India. A documentary is being made about the origin story of everything that happens that you'll hear some other time. But I can't tell you how much doubt has happened in that time. How much doubt of how in the world am I going to keep this afloat? And yet every single time it was continuing to get up and lean into that, to face that, the suffering of that doubt becomes less and less and less. And so the five hindrances are something that you and I get to work on together. What are they? Desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, agitation and doubt. The Buddha said, if you and I can begin to just observe them, this is not about getting rid of them. It's just observing them. It's understanding that when they arise, you and I have not done anything wrong. It's just being in the sandbox of this dualistic plane of form. But we help one another remember more and more and more. And by doing that, not only are we daring to dream on this particular level, but now we are daring to dream beyond human understanding. And what a beautiful experience it is to be able to be that, to see that, to welcome that. And when we forget, here's the most important part, to have compassion. Oh, I, I forgot yesterday. Agitation came in with a, our rental car broke down. I got agitated. I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. And for a moment, I just had to go, okay, those things kind of happen. So I don't stand here saying that I've mastered all of those things. Each of those things are a daily thing. But what a beautiful practice to be able to name that and to become more and more in tune with the idea that truly the only reality, as Ernest Holmes said, is a divine design.
even in its apparent absence. So it is. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the things that you know we do here is we support people in their dreams. We support industry, well, not industries, other um, nonprofits beyond these walls. You know, we, we do things for people who are unhoused and experiencing food insecurity. And as you say, if there's something that you want to see come true, then you support someone else in doing that. So the church is tithing to your kaleidoscope child. Whoa! God. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. All right, let's pray. So we take all that we have heard and we allow it to just move into that wonderful place of gestating, of developing, of growing. That seed has now been planted in such wonderfully fertile soil. And we say, yes, yes. I am open, I am willing, I am receptive. Show me what to do. And yes, I will wait 24 hours before I lose my mind on social media. And I move into that place of simply accepting that right where I am, the presence of God is the love, the truth, all of it, celebrating itself by means of me. So we take all that we have heard and we allow it to inform our lives. We allow it to be the blessing that it is. We allow ourselves to be blessed and to be a blessing, knowing that this church is a blessing. Every aspect of this. So we bless this church. We bless all churches, all paths to God, all mosques, all ashrams, temples, synagogues, cathedrals, any place where people gather. And we know that the light shines brighter. We also surround this entire planet with that knowing of truth that there is indeed only one of us here and we are willing to be the blessing. We are willing to know the blessing. We are willing to be that compassion for ourselves and everyone else on this planet, for all beings everywhere. How wonderful to know that we get to choose and we choose yes, we choose oneness, we choose compassion, we choose to know that we are being informed, infused, and guided and guarded by something greater. So with a true gratitude, I release this word into the activity of the law, God's spiritual law, knowing it is already so, and together we say, amen.